What's the goal of basketball? To win, right? But not just to win individual games. The ultimate goal is to win a championship. Of course, basketball is a team sport. Championships are won by the most complete, most inspired team. Every champion deserves credit, but the question on my mind is, who's the greatest team of all time? With apologies to Bill and Wilt, I have a list of eight teams since 1970 that I want to look at as having a claim to that distinction. It is a loaded question, and one that I ultimately can't answer. Is it the teams that were front runners from beginning to end? The ones who were unbeatable at their peak? Maybe the ones who tapped into something special and overcame countless obstacles? There is no right answer. It's your job to make your own call and it's my job to make the case. So today, I'll be making the case for the 1972 Los Angeles Lakers as the greatest basketball team of all time. I have two questions that are relevant to the 1972 Los Angeles Lakers. What's worse? To be great? To compete and to reach and to dream and to come so close to your dream only to see it fall away? Or to never have had a chance in the first place? And can fate ever change? For the Lakers, fate was a static entity. It was heartbreak. Between 1958 and 1971, the Lakers appeared in eight NBA Finals. They lost all eight. Seven of those losses came at the hands of the Boston Celtics, and three of those Finals defeats came down to a seventh game, all decided by three points or fewer. The ideas of fate and fortune are already muddy, though. You don't lose eight Finals without making the Finals eight times. The Minneapolis Lakers were blessed with Elgin Baylor before the 1958-1959 season. They had just wrapped up a season that would stand as the worst in Laker history for over 55 years. The Lakers weren't winning, no one was coming to the games, and the owner was actively considering pulling the plug on the franchise. Remember, this was back when teams just folded. The Providence Steamrollers, Waterloo Hawks, Indianapolis Olympians, Teams were born, lived, and died real deaths back then, and the Lakers seemed like they were headed for the morgue. The very next year, as a rookie, Elgin Baylor took the Lakers to the finals. In 1960, the Lakers moved to Los Angeles and kept their name, a keepsake of their home state, the land of 10,000 lakes, and Elgin Baylor became the first star athlete in Los Angeles pro sports. There, he reinvented basketball. Alongside Bill Russell, he turned basketball into a vertical sport. Where Russell defied convention and leapt at opposing scores, Elgin took flight to score, practically inventing the convention of hang time. Along with Bob Cousy, Elgin made basketball entertaining. With his leaping ability and dunks, mid-air acrobatics, pull-up jump shot, and trademark running bank shot, Elgin Baylor created the position of small forward as we know it. Everyone who has come since has been some evolutionary form of him. From LeBron to Pippen to Bird to Dr. J, that line ends at the man they called Mr. Inside. He changed the game and in the process saved the Lakers. For my money, the man deserves to be remembered as the most important Laker of all time. Aside from a new hometown in 1960, the Lakers also acquired a standout prodigy from the University of West Virginia, one Jerry West. Jerry West soon developed into the perfect partner for Elgin, even earning the nickname, among many others, of Mr. Outside. As a player, West was textbook. He was a picture-perfect player. He dribbled perfectly. He shot perfectly. He defended perfectly. His exploits are legendary, from the fifth highest scoring average in NBA history to the highest scoring clip for a single playoff run ever. 
to becoming the first and still the only player to be named the most valuable player in a final series while playing on the losing team. West came before his time perhaps, able to knock down jump shots from all angles from everywhere on the court. With a three-point line, it's tough to say. Maybe some of those losses would have swung another way. He was a famously intense competitor, with a burning fire that rivaled that of even Bill Russell and Oscar Robertson. But unlike so many of his contemporaries, past and present, West's intensity did not come from the desire to vanquish or the need to win. It came from a fear of losing. It was a consequence of his own talent that he should have had such high expectations and a casualty of fate that he should have had to bear so many losses. He bore those losses with Elgin through and through, each one etching itself deeper and deeper into the psyche of the team and its stars. Some years, like 62 and 65, stand out as being particularly heartbreaking in a string of gut-wrenching losses. If basketball teams were literary series, the 1960s Lakers would nestle miserably into the pages of a series of unfortunate events. It wasn't that the Lakers weren't good enough. They just could not get the breaks. It's a part of every champion, a certain amount of luck, and the Lakers were forced to come to grips with the fact that they just did not have any. There was another missing ingredient though. This was still the age of giants, remember, and perimeter players were boons, no doubt, but it was the big man that carried teams to promised lands. On July 8, 1968, the Lakers sought to change their fortunes. They got a center, and not just any center, they acquired the greatest anomaly in basketball history, perhaps the most dominant individual player who has ever put leather through nylon, the Big Dipper, Wilt Chamberlain. Unfortunately, Chamberlain had his own hapless relationship with fate. His reign of excellence just so happened to coincide with that of the greatest winner in team sport history, his friend and adversary, Bill Russell. Wilt had won just one championship in his career, where Russell had led his Boston Celtics to a trove of them, even an unprecedented run of eight consecutive championships. As great as Wilt was as a player, he was the foil to Russell's team-centric focus. Wilt impressed with stats. Russell impressed with outcomes. Wilt was the selfish villain. Russell, the altruistic hero. Wilt was a loser. Russell was a winner. So it made only too much sense that Wilt should put on the purple and gold and add his considerable talents to those of West and Baylor. How the forum did not implode under the weight of the combined misfortune that those three players carried remains a mystery. Their first season together happened also to be Russell's last. It culminated in a loss, in the finals, in seven games, to the Celtics. Again. The next year, in 1970, the Lakers lost to the New York Knicks in the finals in seven games. And their final game of the 1971 season was a defeat at the hands of the Milwaukee Bucks in the Western Conference Finals in Game 5. The young Kareem Abdul-Jabbar had emerged as the league's premier talent, with seemingly no equal to be found in all of basketball. The Bucks would go on to win the championship and stake their claim as the greatest team ever. Their opponents changed from year to year, but the antagonist to their story, through it all, amounted to and felt like nothing less than fate for the Lakers. They had to sit there and watch defining, generational, iconic moments happen right in front of them at their expense. They were doomed to lose. By the start of the 1971-1972 season, the championship window of the Los Angeles Lakers was closing if it hadn't shut already. Elgin, West, and Wilt were all in their 30s. They had a rookie head coach, played in a powerful division against the Suns and the Warriors, with an eminent contender out east in the Knicks, and the next dynasty to be in the Bucks looming in their own conference. Their reign had ended before it ever began. Through the first nine games of the season, 
the Lakers were 6-3. and three. Nothing special. Following that ninth game, the most important player in Lakers history called it quits. Elgin had endured a number of serious injuries and been subject to a litany of surgeries throughout his career. At the age of 37, he just couldn't do it anymore. Writing to the people of Los Angeles on Friday, November 5th, 1971, I had hoped to end my career after one last successful season. Out of fairness to the fans, to the Lakers, and to myself, I have always wanted to perform on the court up to the standards that I have established throughout my career. I do not want to prolong my career at a time when I cannot maintain these standards. The Lakers took to the court that Friday evening and won for their missing comrade. They won the next game they played too, and the one after that. In fact, the Los Angeles Lakers would not lose a game for over two months. During that winning streak, the Lakers became the team that they were always meant to be. Led by West and Wilt, they received historic contributions up and down the roster. Gail Goodrich partnered with West to form one of the vaunted backcourts in Hoops history. Elgin was replaced by Jim McMillan, a precision shooter with an arsenal built around feints and fakes that freed up space for him to release his pinpoint perfect shot. Happy Hairston complimented Wilt in the front court, a veteran of the league who sacrificed what had been a steady diet of shots to focus on his excellent abilities as a rebounder. Flynn Robinson and Pat Riley, yeah, that Pat Riley, were a pair of sharp shooting stars off the bench, and John Trapp and Leroy Ellis brought extra sides to the squad as reserves. Helming the team was Bill Sharman, an innovative coach in every sense of the word. He was a firm believer in calisthenics, repetition, conditioning, and an eye for detail. So great was his commitment to getting it right that it was said that the Lakers practiced more than any other team in pro sports. He convinced players, get this, to eat healthy and quit smoking. And on game days, Sharman required that his team be at the arena early so as to familiarize themselves with the various quirks and eccentricities of courts. The team didn't run any plays during these warmups. They just shot the ball, jogged around the court, loosened their muscles, and attuned their mentalities. This practice became known as shoot around and is now a staple in every basketball program at every level across the world. The results speak for themselves. Now there are a lot of famous streaks in sports. Richard Petty won 10 races in a row in 1967. Joe DiMaggio recorded a hit in 56 consecutive games in 1941. The UCLA Bruins men's basketball team won seven consecutive championships between 1967 and 1973. The Oakland A's 20-game win streak was immortalized in Michael Lewis's outstanding money ball. But if there is one streak that deserves the demonstrative title as the streak, it is the 1972 Lakers win streak. Those Lakers won 33 games in a row. It remains the longest win streak in Major League American pro sports history. In those 33 games, the Lakers began exercising their demons. They exacted revenge and righted wrongs that they had borne for over a decade. Although West had entered a new phase of his career and was far removed from setting scoring records for playoff runs, the man was still every bit of the perfectionist, still delivered the most complete package of any player in the league. I mean, by this point, West was the logo of the goddamn league. He was the second leading scorer on the Lakers, separated by decimal points from Goodrich and paced the entire NBA in assists. He finished as the runner-up for MVP and was as dangerous as he was experienced. There was nothing that you could put in front of Jerry West that he hadn't dealt with before. He could beat you on both ends, go to the hole, pick you apart from outside, control the tempo of the game with only a thought, and then, when he was inevitably double-teamed so as to save his opponent from embarrassment, he had evolved into one of the preeminent distributors in basketball. On an average night for Jerry West, you were getting 26 points, five rebounds, 10 assists, and first team all defensive stopping power. And when the moment got big, 
when the man was rolling and the game came down to the wire, you got to find out why they also called him Mr. Clutch. He might have scored more in other seasons, been the unquestioned leader, been a more intimidating athlete, but never did Jerry West contribute in a more total, all-encompassing way than he did in 1972. One of the beneficiaries of West's lauded talents was his backcourt mate, Gail Goodrich. Selected to five all-star teams throughout his Hall of Fame career, Goodrich was LA's hometown hero. Born in Los Angeles, he attended UCLA and laid the foundation for John Wooden's dynasty, leading the Bruins to an undefeated championship season in 1964 and scoring a then record 42 points to clinch back-to-back -back titles in the 1965 championship game. He was a slick southpaw ball handler and a superb shooter who could abuse unequipped defenders and finish fast breaks with strength. Think Manu Ginobili with more minutes, more scoring, and a mop top. By 72, the lefty was hitting his stride in every meaningful way. He led the Lakers in scoring, played all 82 games, and was the third best free throw shooter in the league. With West, the pair combined for an average of 50 points a game and belong in the conversation of the greatest backcourt ever. You couldn't ask for more from a pair of guards. And the guy that made it all tick, who brought the team together and made possible this turning of tides, was Wilt Chamberlain. For as long as Wilt Chamberlain played basketball, he was expected to win. He was Goliath. He towered over other players in size and reduced them to footnotes in reputation. He averaged 50 points a game for a season. He scored 100 points in a game. It was said that he once dunked a ball so hard that when it landed on someone's foot, bones were broken. Great players are often known for being great adapters, capitalizing on the advantages of their eras. Wilt was different. He didn't adapt to basketball. Basketball was forced to adapt to him which is why his 1972 campaign stands out in a career of abnormality. For all of his accomplishments, the rap on Wilt was that he wasn't a team player. He was said to be incapable of suppressing his own impeccable talents in the name of fulfilling his team's needs. He'd won a championship in 1967, leading his Philadelphia team to a league record 68 wins in the process. But this triumph was seen as more of an aberration than an example. And even for those who did give the merit weight, it damned him even more. It proved that he could play team first basketball and his teams could win championships. Hell, they could win more games than any other team had ever won if he would just play the right way. Can you see where I'm going with this? 1972 stands out because it was a year where Wilt did play the right way. The Dipper focused solely on defending, rebounding, converting high percentage shots, and starting fast breaks. If that sounds like a familiar strategy, it's because it's exactly what Bill Russell did during his 13-year reign. It's funny to look at Wilt's numbers this year, because it might lead you to remark at how unremarkable they are, for him at least. The man who'd once averaged 50 points a night was now chalking up an average of 14 a game. It makes you think that he must have lost a step, but he hadn't. He wasn't any less of a monster. He was making sacrifices in the name of winning basketball. He had two 30-30 games that season, led the league in boards, was third in minutes played, and put up 24 points, 29 rebounds, eight blocks, and eight assists in game five of the finals. This was before the Defensive Player of the Year award was introduced, but Wilt was arguably the best defender in the league, leading it in defensive win shares and making first team all defense. His relationship with Sharman was one of the best Wilt ever had with a coach, especially surprising considering Sharman wore green and white during his playing days as a Boston Celtic. West might well have been the most valuable player in the league, but Wilt Chamberlain was the most valuable player on the Los Angeles Lakers. This season was different, and the Lakers knew it. It was palpable, you could feel it. Even West, the long-tortured soul who possessed a misery that was itself nearly artful, 
described the process of playing basketball in the 72 Lakers as a pleasure. This comes from a man whose autobiography is titled West by West, My Charmed, Tormented Life. The records didn't stop at the winning streak. By the end of the regular season, the Lakers had won 69 games, the most an NBA team had ever won, and a record that would stand for over two decades. There may not have been a more well-rounded basketball team, ever. The 72 Lakers led the league in points, assists, and rebounds. They finished second in both field goal percentage and opposing field goal percentage. They scored 100 or more points in 81 of their 82 regular season games. They maintained the highest point differential of any team ever. And with two first team defenders, it's no wonder they ended up with the second best defensive rating in the league. Wilt's outlet passing opened up the floor and made the Lakers the most feared fast break team in the league. And in the half court, this veteran, disciplined squad executed set plays to perfection, shot with accuracy, and were at their best when the game came to them. They could scramble and improvise, solving puzzles on the fly. These Lakers played a timeless style of basketball, maybe the best quality a team can have in the discussion of the best teams ever. They ruled their season, but this team might have been better suited to a more modern era, especially one with a three-point shot. Their center converted 65% of his shots. They played at a frenetic pace. They might have been even better had they played today. A terrifying thought for a team that won 33 games in a row and finished with 69 wins. Again, the waters are muddy. This was a team tortured by fate for nigh on a generation. Is it fitting or ironic that they should have this transcendent season, one touched by nothing less than destiny? On the one hand, it must have seemed like this was finally going to be the year to get them over the hump. The year that they upend their lots and claim what should have been theirs. On the other, this collision course with history would have seemed like some perverse trap to me. I would have lost sleep over the idea that this would end up being the most elaborate trick fate ever pulled. A season unlike any other, used as a vehicle to deliver the killing blow. Another gutting, heartbreaking, soul-claiming loss. If this was going to be the ordained summiting of the mountain, it was going to be one for the rest of time. Likewise, if this was going to be only the most recent chapter in a story of ruin, its scar would linger in perpetuity. There was a mountain of evidence to illustrate fate's true intentions. It had never mattered before how good the Lakers' record was, how inspired their team was. Some of the most heroic, fearless, legendary performances in championship basketball history meant nothing. Fate had it out for the Lakers. To win this championship, they would have to do nothing less than defy the gods of providence. They entered the postseason undaunted. They made quick work of their first round opponent, the Chicago Bulls, with a four-game sweep. They earned little reprieve with this victory, though, as they found themselves matched up against the Milwaukee Bucks a 63-win team who entered the series not just as defending champions, not just coming off of one of the great seasons ever, but as the proclaimed team of the future. The center matchup between reigning league MVP Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Chamberlain took center stage as the two Titans went to war. The series did not disappoint. It featured damn near everything. Singular performances, collaborative efforts, low-scoring blowouts, and high-scoring nail-biters. Three games were decided by four points or fewer. The Lakers won all three. With a victory in Game 6, LA punched its ticket back to the Finals. They were met by the New York Knicks, a rematch of the 1970 Finals. Here they were, the final step. The final victory that had eluded them for so long what could end up being the culmination of all the greatness, of all the competition, of all the reaching and dreaming and the falling short.
It took three days for the championship victory to really set in for West. He couldn't believe it. The season was over, and his was the team left standing. They'd done it. Gail Goodrich, the hometown hero, led the series in scoring. Wilt Chamberlain, the selfish villain, the moody individual, the loser, was named the finals MVP for the most successful basketball team the game had ever seen. It took years. It took over a decade of contending. It took tears. It took courage and determination beyond measure to fall again and again, to contemplate the worth of the pain, and to fight again all the same. It took the greatest basketball team of all time to beat fate. The 1972 Los Angeles Lakers walked off the court as just that, the greatest basketball team ever, and as champions. Finally.